I want to thank you for coming back on with us to talk about this situation in Nagorno-Karabakh. This is a very troubling situation that now has extended from the end of last year. I mean, this goes back decades, but the most recent iteration of this, this blockade, starting late last year, it is continuing as we speak right now in June, um, we're talking about this, and it is still going on. Can you set the scene and help people understand what this blockade is and what exactly is going on? Certainly. Well, thank you for the privilege of being able to share the pain and the passion. I visited the area many, many times during war times. And to set the scene briefly, Armenia was the first nation in the world to become Christian way back in 301. And the little land of Nagorno-Karabakh is part of ancient Armenia, and Armenians have lived there uh, for 1,700 years. And you get some of the oldest churches and stone crosses in the world in that little holy land. And uh, it is now a situation of tragedy and of conflict. Azerbaijan, where Stalin relocated this little bit of ancient Armenia, Gona Karabakh, he took it off from Armenia and stuck it as part of his divide and rule tactics into Azerbaijan. It's now an area within Azerbaijan. In September 2020, Azerbaijan unleashed military offensives against the Armenians who live in that historic Armenian land, and they now occupy a significant proportion of the land of Nagorno-Karabakh. And it's said they've already destroyed at least three churches. We can't prove that because we can't go there to see. But also the stone crosses and the historic Christian monuments that are in that land. But the really worrying things are the continuing aggression against the Armenians who live there. Um, Just one brief example, just last night, Azerbaijan killed four Armenian servicemen. They do it with impunity. But in a slightly longer time frame, in December last year, um, Azerbaijan blocked off the road that leads from Armenia into Nagorno-Karabakh. And that's the road they depend on for food, for medical supplies, for getting casualties out and so on. That has been blocked since December last year. So there's a huge shortage of food and medicines inside Nagorno-Karabakh and a lot of suffering. They've also cut off electricity supply a lot of the time. And of course, in the winter, that was bitterly cold. So hypothermia was a real, real problem. And Azeris um, are now also attacking farmers. So it's difficult to grow food and that heightens the food shortage. And I think one of the things that worries those of us who know the situation is that Azerbaijan is doing this with complete impunity. It's not being called to account by the international community. It's getting away. That blockade of the road can almost be the beginning of another genocide, of people just being starved to death. And they're getting away. No one has challenged or opened up that blockade of the road. And as I said, it's causing enormous suffering. And the impunity... Uh, There's one thing that really bugs me very, very badly, and that is in that September 2020 war, prisoners, of course, were taken on both sides. In the ceasefire agreement, it was agreed that both sides would release prisoners. Armenia released all the Azerbaijani prisoners. Azerbaijan has not released the Armenian prisoners, so they're being still held in captivity uh, against the ceasefire agreement, and Azerbaijan, again, getting away with impunity. There's a suffering there is very intense, very multifaceted, and really does need much more uh, attention, political attention, and for those of us who are Christians, uh, prayer support, because the suffering is, well, almost too much to even begin to describe. You know, I I have spoken with mothers who were not able to get medicine for their children. You talk about this road, this this corridor, this Latin corridor, that road is the only way in and out. And so blocking that, as you were saying, it prevents food, resources. You know, if you need a surgery or a doctor's appointment, there are people who have struggled to get out. The Red Cross has helped people to get in and out here or there when it's approved to to do so. One of the things that has been very troubling and difficult to discern is why there's a denial. And I'm sure you've seen this again and again. Azerbaijan has denied that they've been blocking the road. And they'll show images, people on social media, of the Red Cross going in or out. And they'll say, look, the Red Cross is able to get there and get out. And it's interesting because my first thought 
um, just as a thinking human being in those moments is, well, if the Red Cross is needed to get in and out there, then there's a crisis of some sort, it seems, right? These these aren't just random vehicles. But what do you make of that claim that has been made again and again that this actually isn't happening, that there is no blockade? Well, it's basically a lie. There is a lot of evidence there to prove that blockade. Um, vehicles have been allowed through, particularly the Red Cross vehicles. Some of those have been allowed through. Some have been allowed to bring in some food, some medical supplies. So some is allowed in, but only the Red Cross, not the ordinary citizens. And the amount that comes in is obviously not enough to meet the enormous needs of the people in these very, very difficult times. So, yes, there is some passage through that blockaded road, but the road is significantly blockaded and it's not open to civilians and to the, the enormous amount of food, medical supplies and other supplies that the people desperately need and are really suffering from not having them. You had you had said a number of things about the history that were very helpful for people to understand. This goes back quite a while. And I think for observers who are watching this, they wonder, you know, okay, this is impacting this historic Christian community, the Armenians. Is it a religious battle? Is it a land battle? Is it both? You know, in light of the details and the facts, how would you respond to that question for those who might have it? I think you can only respond to it by saying what is happening, not by what is said. And what is happening and has been happening is a significant and systematic destruction of Christian heritages. There is a land called Nikitschivan that when Stalin was doing his relocation and relocating people in different contexts, this was part of ancient Armenia that Stalin relocated into the territory of Azerbaijan. And I was there actually in the early 1990s when the battles were going on and the Armenians were trying to defend themselves to live there, but they couldn't. But you have some of the most historic, obviously, seeing as Armenian, historic churches and monuments and crosses in the world in the Kichivan. And I hate to say it, but they've all been completely obliterated. If you drive in the Kichivan now, you don't just see ruins. It's nothing. They've been entirely obliterated. It's a bare land. And the fear is that if Azerbaijan is allowed to get control of Nagorno-Karabakh, it will do the same. And some of the most wonderful, beautiful, historic Christian uh, pre- treasures of churches, monuments, crosses, and so on, there's a fear that they will be annihilated like the crosses and the churches were in the Kichivan. And so the facts have to speak for themselves. You don't have to ask for a motive. There is a complete destruction of Christian heritage. And right now, I know the United States is trying to broker, you know, a peace treaty here, a deal that would bring the two sides together that's currently going on right now. What what should the world be doing? I mean, that seems like a step, you know, but what how should the international community be treating this situation right now? Well, it really one or two suggestions. The international community should be calling Azerbaijan to account for the suffering it has already caused and is continuing to cause, you know, with that blockade of the road, with the, uh, as I say, the killing to early this morning of four Armenians, they should be called to account. There should be sanctions applied to require Azerbaijan to provide the things that Armenian people need for survival. And, you know, and just for a quality of life. Schools have had to be closed because there's no food. Um, hospitals are having to do with minimal medical supplies. You try and get medical supplies and shops, they're empty. So Azerbaijan could be being called to account just to make available the things that people should have living in their own land. So there should be the annihilation of the blockade that should be opened up. There should be the accessibility to the materials that people desperately need for survival. And there should be the release of the prisoners. And those, I think, would be three of my priorities. And as a chance, this could be with complete impunity. You, know, you have made really throughout your your life and your career, you have spent a lot of time going to places that maybe a lot of other people wouldn't want to go to because they're difficult places. You've been to that particular region, I believe, ninety times. I mean, it, it's an insane number of times that you've that you've been there. Um, you've also been to North Korea, I believe, three times. What is it that drives you to be so vocal on human rights and to take those trips and go to those places? Well. Briefly, I introduced myself. I was a nurse and a social scientist by intention, as I thought I was doing my life. 
and a baroness by astonishment. It wasn't into politics, the first baroness I'd ever met. But you get the title of baroness, it means you speak in the House of Lords, one of the houses of the British Parliament. And I was absolutely shocked by the privilege. And I remember the day after I got it, saying my prayers, saying, God, how do I use the privilege of being able to speak in the House of Lords, like the Senate, the upper house of the British Parliament? And the idea came very clearly. It's a wonderful place to be a voice for people whose voices are not heard. And so that is what's behind so much of our work. Um, people are suffering, as everyone will know, in many parts of the world, and obviously Ukraine hits the headlines, and rightly so. The suffering is horrific. But we don't hear about so much that they're suffering. And many of the people suffering in war zones or under oppression and persecution aren't reached by the major aid organisations like the UN for security reasons or political reasons. Uh, for the political side, they can only go places with permission of a sovereign government. The government is victimising a minority, doesn't give them permission, they can't go. Uh, so we, my little organization, HEART, Humanitarian Aid Relief Trust, we have an American branch of that, by the way, uh, we do send our time, if needs be, crossing borders illegally uh, to be with the people who are suffering war and persecution, not reached by the major aid organizations, to take both aid and advocacy. And obviously, Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh has been one of our priorities and still is. Um, I've been, sorry, I'm told, I don't count. But the Armenians tell me I've been to Armenia 90 times, God quite believe. I think I'm facing about 87 to Nagorno Karabakh because I can't go recently. But um, but we do also work in Sudan, the suffering in Sudan, in Nigeria. And um, we don't hear about that. You know, 5,000 Christians killed in Nigeria in the Middle Belt alone in recent months. So we do go there. Um, we go to places and we call it Burma, not Myanmar, because people prefer that. But with the Shan people and the Shin people, because they're not reached by major aid organizations. We don't hear about the military bombardments to which they're subjected, you know, almost as we're speaking now. So it's a great privilege. As a Christian, we have a mandate, don't we? St. Paul said to the church at Corinth, where one part of the body of Christ suffers, we all suffer. So we do have a mandate to care for the persecuted church. And we should fulfill that mandate in heart. So we try to do it particularly for those who are unreached by other major organizations for political or security reasons. The other reason other people don't go, maybe it's too dangerous because there is war going on. Well, we go with the local people and it's a privilege to be alongside them. And the other thing is that we don't only work for Christians. And the biblical mandate also is heal the sick, feed the hungry, speak for the oppressed, not just the Christian hungry and oppressed. So we will also speak for Muslims suffering in Blue Nile in Sudan. Uh, we'll speak for Buddhists uh, suffering in Burma. But the majority of our partners, we work with local partners, and they're the real heroes and heroines. They are Christians, because it is Christians who are suffering the most persecution in the world today. And what a privilege to be alongside them. And, and that persecution is tragically increasing around the world. And I think that that is often shocking to people in America and in the West who are living, yes, you know, there are struggles that are going on, there are things that are happening, but it's nothing like what we are describing going on. And I mean, you can't even compare the dynamics um, not that they don't matter, but they're very different. I wanted to ask you, because I'm sure you don't always get asked this question, and I don't always get to ask it, but as we close out here, how can people be praying for Nagorno-Karabakh and the Armenian people there? Thank you. Because one of these always humbles me so much. And when we visit our Christian brothers and sisters who are suffering so horrifically, we always ask them, what's your priority? And if I was one of them, I'd say food or water or whatever. But uh, sorry, turn that one, I'll take that one away. Um, no problem. But their priority request is always for prayer. And that makes me so humble. I'd be praying, I'd be asking for the food and the water and everything else. They ask for prayer. And so I think that's the answer to your question. Their priority is prayer, please. And prayer needs to be informed prayer. So it is important that um, our wonderful friends in the United States do study a little bit what is actually happening in Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh so that prayer can be informed prayer. And the situation is changing. The danger is escalating every day. And um, therefore, if you can't access uh, the information, then well, prayer is their priority request. And it can be informed prayer, which will be that much more, I think, valuable and appreciated. 
As always, it is wonderful to connect with you. Thank you for taking us through this issue and giving us those prayer points. We look forward to having you on again very soon.